Elder Drew set to go, and actually we have one item uh, to discuss before we get to what's on the agenda. This is something Mr. Whitaker has uh, in regard to the draft military applicant rule language that is on your iPads. And Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, committee members, this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, this is some, some draft rule language that uh, is coming about as a result of a statute passed in the 2013 session, which requires most, if not all, regulatory programs to um, promulgate rules to allow for expedited renewal of licenses, permits, or um, as the case may be, for folks who are active duty military or get deployed or something of that nature. Uh, the draft language that you have in front of you um, I haven't determined exactly where in the rules that will go yet but uh, this is language that was um, provided to me from up the food chain I made some tweaks to make it specific to accountancy as much as as possible but there really wasn't a lot to do to it except make sure the the numbers and subsections were right so um, <clears throat> Once the uh, committee members and tomorrow the full board members have had an opportunity to review the language, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer any questions I can. But um, as based on my experience with, with this board, I just haven't seen a lot of deployed military folk related issues coming down the pike or, um, for this program. So, you know, it may be something that, that ends up as a rule because it had to be made a rule, but either never gets used or very seldom does. But, um, but again, it's based on a statutory change, and um, so all of the programs have to do it that I'm aware of in our division. So um, this is the rule language for this program, and uh, I'll entertain questions. And if there are no questions, I would request a referral to the full board with a recommendation to approve the language and um, to get it set for rulemaking hearing as quickly as possible along with the other language previously approved by uh, the full board relative to CPE penalty hours which has not yet been able to be set right at this time. I don't have any. Motion to uh, refer to the full board with a recommendation for approval of the language and um, to set for a rulemaking hearing as soon as practicable. So moved. You can second. Any, yeah, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We'll go back to the, if I can do it, back to the original agenda. First item we have here is the discussion of the exposure draft on the UAA regarding revised definitions, which I believe we have a copy on our iPad. Have a kind of a summary of this. I assume it's they're adding the attestation standards references for that. Yes, this is uh, dealing primarily with prospective financial statements and including them in that uh, bucket, making sure that we include that. Uh, one thing I will point out is under this UAA exposure draft, compilations are not considered an attest function in Tennessee, they are by rule, or maybe it is by statute, but they are considered an attest function here in Tennessee. Um, so this is out there. We don't have to adopt it. Uh, at the uh, board meeting in Palm Springs that I attended uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the full board of directors of NASBA did adopt this uh, to be part of the UAA. For reference. Just for reference, wanted to let you all know that it was there. They'd approved it. Um, and at some point, we may want to look at uh, revising our rules and definitions to more closely align with the UAA in regard to attest functions.
something we need to take up today or Mr. Brewer is on the UAA committee and has more extensive knowledge on this, uh, so he can fill you in. Comments or questions about that? The next item for discussion is discussion on the exposure draft of the UAA for firm mobility guidance. We've got that in our opinion. And this just kind of goes along with the same language that we've added that was added in there actually on this one the comments are due tomorrow so you have a you have an opportunity to comment on this particular exposure draft if you desire to do so um, fur mobility is uh, a hot topic right now um, clearly from the uh, information you were sent there are some states that are opposing it for various and sundry reasons here in Tennessee we have firm mobility this exposure draft offers language to add to the UAA to hopefully make firm mobility rules and statutes more uniform across the 55 jurisdictions. Seems like most of the <clears throat> reference, I guess the changes or edits were regarding the SSAEs as well. It had a lot to do with it, yes. So the big, yeah. Comments or questions on this? Want to respond to this and, and have any comments, or do you want to let it slide by? So when are the comments due tomorrow, or today? tomorrow? I can I can draft them for you uh, tonight for board approval if you desire to comment on it, uh, or like I said, we can just let I, I can send them in Saturday morning, Gabe. I hate to do that without Troy being here to uh, give us the, his view on it, you know. You Only hesitation. Always copy him, I don't yeah. know, by email or something like that, or can mm -hmm. he do that? Copy Troy? Yeah. Certainly. I mean, I don't know if they'll read anything he's saying, but yeah. at least you can try. I mean, they will accept something a couple of days late. I mean, it, the due date's tomorrow, but the, if I did it first next week, that would be fine. What if we drafted up a response and send it to Troy to get his opinion? Can you? I guess you can do that. I can try that, Stephen. Like Trey said, if he's if he's ill and not reading his emails, then that's going to be difficult. But but I will certainly draft something and send it to him. Do you want to draft something in in support of the mobility uh, guidance or not? I agree. 
assume we don't need to make, make a motion for that or we just carry that to the full board to, to discuss. Sounds like you're going to carry it to the full board to discuss. All I've got on the agenda, any other comments or things we need to discuss? Nothing else, Mr. Eldridge, Mr. Roberts, do you have anything? Ms. Watkins. For a, oh. <laughs> I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. I uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? Adjourn. Yeah. Who's this guy? Who's a wing it? It's one of your guys. We'll go ahead and call the licensing committee to order. I have four items on the agenda today that I've got listed here. The first item we have is an application from Western CPE for um, course approval. I believe we discussed this at our last meeting and we had requested more information to be more specific towards Tennessee state specific ethics. Everybody's got a copy on their iPad of what they've what they've resubmitted, so I will open up the floor for any discussion on that. Mark, if you had a chance to look at that, what they've resubmitted as well. Yes, and we think it, it meets the requirements now. Okay. Motion to accept it. Sure. As we have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All, oppo all opposed? Motion carries. Folks, if you don't mind, let me remind you, uh, pull the microphone to you and speak into it. If it doesn't light up, then you're not being recorded. Yeah. You're all. <laughs> Next item we have is a request from the Middle, Middle Tennessee chapter of certified fraud, fraud examiners for exempt sponsor status. Again, we've got a copy of their request via email in your packet take a few minutes to look at that and open up for any discussion the issue they had is in previously they had operated under the their <coughs> national board's NASBA number that's correct and I don't know that we gotten the reason why but for some reason they were told that NASBA new standards will not allow them to use the to use their number in the future and they've got to get their get their own number I'd be curious as to what that reasoning is I'll I'll get a copy of those new standards and review them Steve and give you an answer uh, I'll email it to you before the next meeting Any discussion on this item? But to accept it or we want to table it until the next meeting? Make a motion to accept it. Motion to accept. Do I have a second? Second. It was properly <laughs> motion was properly seconded. <laughs> Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Next item we have is a request from MTAS for clarification that approval for CPE credit includes the CMFO, CMFO exam. I believe, if I remember correctly, at, the, at previous meeting we, we did approve the CMFO, well, we approved the MTAS program for CPE, but we didn't specifically specify the CMFO exam. Is that correct? That's correct. We just need to make, uh, I mean, do we need a formal motion for this or just need to get it in the minutes to <clears throat> clarification? I think we need to get it in the minutes for clarification, Mr. Eldridge. Okay. Or do we need to have any comment about the number of hours CPE? Is that just a standard? No, I, I, it's just standard. Any other comments or questions? 
So we do we just as a committee just make that statement that that. Uh, I think I'd like it in the board minutes, uh, the full board minutes, Mr. Eldridge, if you wouldn't mind mentioning that tomorrow. Okay, we'll do that. Next and final item is a request from Eileen Eli for an extension of the AUD, B, BEC, and FAR exam. This is an item that was added last minute, and we've got the request in your on your iPad. If I can find it. Eli, Ely. I'm not sure how you'd pronounce it. She was writing to, uh, I guess she'd originally written to NASBA, and she was asking to ex extend her scores for AUD, BEC, and FAR. She passed all of those exams with AUD expiring July 31st, 2013, and the BEC and FAR sections expiring October 31st, 2013. Uh, she took the which left the reg section, which she took on, on July 30th of, of 13 and did not pass and retook it again in October of 13. It did not pass. Um, she said she had some series of events that had occurred during that period of time that had affected her test results, in her opinion. Um, I won't read through all the items. But <coughs> <clears throat> There's about six, four, five, or six items that she had, had happened to her during that time. I'll let you take just a minute to read that, and then I'll open up for any comments, discussion. Any thoughts? I understand the uh, the July, August, and September incidents, but I don't understand the year in between. Her passing in October, and I mean, the fact that she was going to lose, it's like she waited till the very last two opportunities, and then. Sounds like a last minute excuse. Is the standard just for good cause shown? Is that what the, I don't remember what the rule said. Is it is it just one of those words basically you can extend it for good cause shown or does it have to On written request of an applicant and for good cause as determined by the board in its discretion may extend the period for completion. Thank you. Any other comments on this? I guess when I look at this, I'm very sympathetic on the July 28th um, situation where dad was, I guess he, he'd been sick with cancer and, and fell and pretty tr traumatic situation. You know, I, I've obviously that's, that's a, in my opinion, that's definitely a, a good cause. If that's the right term. Um, and then he, you know, later passed away. It's the only issue I have with this is that as far as the October exam, 
and I don't know specifically when all this happened, but I mean, it looks like you've almost got two months between that period of time and then when the exam was 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 retaken in, I don't know what day in October. What 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 is the exam? I don't know when she took it. Obviously, it just says October. I mean, if we assume the middle of October, there was a pretty you know month and a half worth of time or so between those events and uh, and you know the last item was that you know they were busy with their year in uh, fiscal year in close which I guess the concern I have is that obviously everybody is busy at various times and is that a good cause for extension Typically, I like to see these in advance of the expiration, um, <coughs> but I haven't lost my father, so I don't know, you know, I can only imagine she's got a, tr you know, that's had all that that's been going on in July, and, you know, I don't know, I don't know the consequences of how long, I mean, death hits people differently. Um, I, I, I waffle on this. I mean, if probably if it had been if it had been asked for in advance looking at it today kind of where it hits me in the gut um, and just feel it, dealing with the loss of a of a parent you know I would I would tend to since it is a broad open for good cause shown it is after the fact that tends me to step back and kind of look and think of it a little differently but I, I mean I'd, I'd I understand she she put it off to the very end. Um, I maybe feel some sympathy for that too because it seems to me I always have good intentions about doing things well in advance, but it seems like with life when you have family job, other extenuating circumstances, things always seem to get pushed off. So I, I feel a little, maybe it's this January morning, a little um, sympathy for um, what she's going through, and could, I could I could see how um, it could affect the ability to focus on studying and and taking a test. But I, I can I can be swayed either way. Definitely, if if going to extend, just make it one peer, one the smallest extension possible to one period. What is that is that three months? It's one window. One window. Uh, we're in the middle of a window now, so I would assume that you'd want to extend it to the end of June, second quarter window. You have to pass all three, right, within that window. No. No. She's asking to have. She keep all three, she's and she has one more to get done. That's what she's asking. Okay. That's what she's asking for to extend all three. Here's my sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> I've never taken the CPA exam, but I hear it as a And the doozy. fact that she missed it by one point? Yeah. Did yeah, you get what, that in the last paragraph? She, yeah, yeah. That's the very last paragraph, in case you didn't see that. I move that we give an extension for one, one period till June 30th. I have a motion to extend for. I'll give you the opportunity this time. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> I know that. No, I, no, I figured that out last time. <laughs> Won't be coming. We have a motion. I'll second the motion. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to extend it one window, which would be to the end of June of 2014. We have a motion. We have a second. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. I think that's all the items we have on our agenda. Any more discussions or things we need to bring up? With that said, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> motion carries. Call the executive executive committee meeting to order. And how to get out of my thing here.
look at your operating results. <coughs> it should be in your uh, your iPad, or you have a hard copy of it. Yep. Okay, somewhere I have that. All right, do y'all have any questions about this? I had, um, I guess maybe just a couple of questions. The um, first thing is to do with the um, state regulatory fee on the um, overall budget. Yes. And I, I know in the attachments you explain how the budget amount for 2015 is calculated, and it's explained very well. My question is simply, what happened that it went down from 86000 in 2013? That's almost a 30% decrease and um, I mean the fiscal year 2014 budget number looks reasonable in relation to 15 but that's a pretty big decrease from actual in 2013 my understanding was when they recalculated it Casey we're going to take a one-time hit kind of to catch up um, uh, that was the, the way it was explained to me last year now mr. Giannini will be in here tomorrow and perhaps he can shed some light on that but but that is the best that I can tell you. It was a it was a one time catch up. You're hits. saying 2013 maybe was just an aberration, really, and not really. Yes, sir. Okay, That's yeah, what I'm not, not a big deal. So. There's no proposal for a adjustment to the fees. Yes, sir. There is. If you'll look in, well, when we get to the budget bill. Yeah, I'm getting hit. I'm, yeah. We're talking about results now. Okay. Remind me what the third party professional fees are. Is that the calligrapher and stuff like that? Third party professional administrative services. That includes, uh, that does include the calligrapher. I want to say that also includes the uh, credit card fees that we pay. Okay. Uh, that's a significant portion of it. <coughs> I don't have any other questions. Okay. Trey. Okay. Uh, no more questions on that. Let's move forward with the. Uh, Um, we can go to the next page on, on the thing as the budget, I guess we'll, we'll come back here to the travel information. That's just next on my pad. Um, so this is the budget for FY 15. I'm sorry. Is that right? Yes. FY 15. Um, have y'all had a chance to look this over? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I've, I've looked it over and, um, really really have any questions at this point I can address mr. Boffs's question in regard to the reduction in the revenue if you look on attachment a bill uh, that last entry there reduction in renewal fee seventy four thousand dollars that is dollars that is ten dollars per licensee uh, guessing how many we're going to have renew or should it be more than that than the ten dollars yeah that was the discussion we had in a previous board meeting right fine right. question is is do you want to you could eat into the reserves and reduce even further well we either we share the reserves with uh, the CPAs or count on getting swept, swept by the administration time. Um, let's come back to that. Help me with the, but we're budgeting $50,000 for a third party, which you raised the question before, but that's the budget for the current year, but uh, significantly more than actual in 13. Yes, sir, that's because it does include charges for the peer review oversight committee. They are not active yet. There will be some charges to that 
uh, line item once they start meeting. Yes, a question is why do we need you, you were raising a question. Uh, Wendy behind you is. Oh, okay. And I agree with those observations. I guess that's something we don't necessarily need to resolve today, but it could be a, a to-do item. I mean, in reconciling it with the rules and really what is practically needed. Sure. I know we've got the three people lined up, but um, that could be a uh, hefty expense that maybe we could uh, reduce. I don't have a problem with leaving it here right now as long as we have a discussion have about a discussion, how that right and yeah. come back at the, and get into it deeper at the next meeting yeah let's add that to the talking agenda next time are you saying add that to talking agenda for this committee or for the rules committee or for the full board I mean I think that could be I'm sorry I think that could be a full board discussion I mean I, I think that's a it's something that's in the rules that we're required to do and I think we need to have a full conversation about how we can accomplish what's in the rules maybe we can leverage what's already in place I guess that's the big question but I do think that would be an appropriate board conversation I, mean, I agree I just don't think we ought to let it fall through the cracks somewhere we need to put it on somebody's absolute agenda and make sure it gets done but I think we're in agreement to have it be an agenda yeah. item at the next meeting, okay. at yep. the next board meeting. Yes, sir. Um, Mark, when you we have this budget coming up with a $2,300 surplus, uh, how conservative would you, uh, or aggressive, would you uh, categorize this budget uh, we have a long history of having significant surpluses at the end of the year, which is fine. I don't want us to spend money just to minimize the surplus. Fine. But <clears throat> how would you categorize this as on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being very liberal and 10 being very conservative? No, I'd say it's maybe a 6 or a 7. Uh, it's right there in the middle um, as always the, the the one of the biggest issues is the travel budget uh, are we going to spend all that money or not we can't spend it if we don't have it budgeted uh, a lot of that is for NASVA members I mean board members to attend NASVA meetings if the board's not involved then we don't spend that money um, I think all the other numbers are fairly conservative my best to, to trim it back where I could we really don't have a projection of how you expect to end fiscal 14 those no, are not yet all the only numbers I've got are through November and they are they're tracking true to form
Okay. Any other questions? Do we want to go ahead and adopt, or do you want to wait and adopt the 15 budget until we resolve the peer review? When do we have to submit it? We need to submit it now. We do. As soon as possible. Okay. Well, we can always because, amend it, yeah, right? Because just because it's in the budget doesn't mean we have to Well, have we have to spend, spend it. it. True. True. So I don't have a problem with this. Hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have uh, you'll be have enough information to come up with a. Uh, at yes, sir. Okay, so I guess uh, we need to approve it here. But will this have to be voted upon by the full board tomorrow? Yes, sir. Yeah. So do we have to do anything other than just wait for the vote tomorrow, or do we need to approve it here? Yes, I probably like a uh, motion to refer to the full board with okay. a recommendation for approval, approval as you've discussed. Okay. I move that we uh, recommend approval to the board. Okay. That second that motion. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Passes. All right. And then uh, you should have in your packet the travel expenses for uh, I believe that will be Ray should be Mark and Don this is here de October 1 through December 31 uh, Means I've got to go look. I've got to Actually, out I, how to make this work. Raise, I believe yours is. Is it from July forward? It just says. Um, well, it's, it's for, a second quarter. Yeah, it's for the second quarter. October, okay. November, yeah, they're all for second quarter. September or uh, October forward. Oh yeah, here. Ray, is most of yours primarily seminars? Yes. <laughs> Investigations in uh, coming to the Nashville office at the bottom. So. A related question is that uh, we're now d able to do uh, ethics training online. I guess the question is why don't we have a videotape of one-time presentation that people could access at any time? Because if you do that, Bill, you have no record of who's attending and you can't send out a certificate uh, because we don't have questions at the end. It's just an, a live presentation. So we have them log in while the presentation's going on so we know who's there and who's attending. But if they're not asking questions, how do you know they're staying on? Because we have them sign in periodically. They're supposed to be signing in periodically during the presentation. And have everybody sign in again at the end. At the end? Yeah. There's, but you should be able to have it to where you could ask questions throughout the process, and that would be an identification of them being on the system, right? Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do CPE at 7.30 at night, and it, it's on a website. It, it's not live. Okay. I can explore that option. That, that is not one that we have talked about. I'm not sure that we have the capability of doing that. I can find out, Bill. Because a lot of providers, or particularly accounting firms, do that. And I'm, I'm very familiar with others where you 
during an hour presentation, you got to log in seven times or something in order to make sure that uh, you haven't gone to sleep or something. <laughs> and I don't want to speak for the society, but I know in the past Brad has offered to work with us to help facilitate that <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. So you might, and Wendy's here, she can probably talk on that. Would you provide qualifies for the ethics CPE? Correct. And you, yeah. Correct. And we have all right. Okay. Let's look at that. How do you go? To the Excited just to be able to do the webcast. Hey, how was the, how was the participation on that? We had uh, 10 participants uh, at one and 36 at the other one, I believe, Trey. Okay. Do you think that's from just from a lack of marketing? I mean, people knowing it's available? I do. Because we put it on the, we put it on the website. Right. Um, not many people are on the website, right? Not many people are on the website, but we did have some people call in wanting to know where they could get it, and we referred them to the webcast. Okay. Do we have the ability to notify firms that, that it's going to be offered in a webcast? or We have email addresses for these firms, like uh, a contact person or somebody? Uh, we should have that on file, yes. You want us to I send out some get, I think you'd get fantastic participation if, you, if the firms knew about it. Right. But it looks like, you know, going on to Don's expense, you know, that there was a presentation for K Burke in Kingsport, TVA in Knoxville, KPMG in Knoxville, you know, traveled all over, PwC in Knoxville, traveled all over in order to prevent, or pre prevent, present. Prevent ethical violations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, we're really accommodating their marketing and training efforts, but you know, when people could just go online and get the ethics training. We are, but, but let's keep in mind that we are reaching these folks in a more personal manner when we are actually there. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind. And, and I think we can do that. I, I wonder if perhaps going to society meetings or things like that may be a better right. uh, venue for us to have visibility or I mean, you know better than I do what other conferences are out there, but somehow I feel like some of those might be better uses of our time instead of just going to an individual firm. Now, I granted we kicked it up to 20 participants, right? Right. And it still sounds like we had quite a few. Was this before or after we changed? This is after we changed. Yeah. But for instance, when you do Dent K. Bird, I mean, it was not just the firm. It was, you know, all the invited guests that so we had, like, Right, no, but that's that's the firm's outreach to their client. It's a marketing yeah. effort. I mean, and many many firms do that. But we don't need to do that at the state board's expense when it can be done more economically. Like the whole point is, is that we can do still do some of these things, uh, but when we go to this many then it, there may be a more efficient way to actually roll out this training that would be much more economical for the board. But, I mean, I think... Cause, okay, I, mean, did I, you, I, I okay. want to take kind of a contrary <coughs> position here to what's being said, because I, I, I do think that this is preventive medicine for our profession to, you know, to get the message out there about ethics. And I know Mark has come over and presented to our firm. We've also had other speakers come in that we paid for. But I just think it's really good um, for the state board to have that personal contact with professionals out there. And I I mean, if you invite guests in, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we would do that as marketing as much as we would just trying to make this training to, available to as many people as we could. 
um, you know, but I just think that's a good idea to go out and present these things. I mean, I think it's good for for our staff. And I think it's good for the firms and good for the profession. So maybe out on a limb by myself, go ahead and saw it off. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You're entitled to your own opinion. All right. Well, you'll pursue some of that with perhaps Wendy or Brad and figure some, and then. Uh, this is our big quarter. Yeah. This, this, this. Right, right. Everybody's because to get everybody's it. trying to get it before year end. I got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on travel? Okay, uh, Mark. We had some requests for endorsement for NASBA vice chair. I know in the past it seems like we have declined to endorse in these things, but is there any reason we would? In the past we have declined to endorse. Uh, I brought these to you because they were sent to me and, and with specific instructions to take them to the board uh, to see about getting an endorsement. I know Mr. Royston had emailed me and indicated that he would support a letter of support for Mr. Odom. But if he is a sole lone voice, then... <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know how y'all feel about this, but I mean, it just seems like in the past, whenever once come before us, we've I agree with what we've done in the past. Declined to if we don't. Yeah, I, I just feel like I don't know enough about the individuals, and I mean, you can read their credentials, and they're all very good. I mean, I I don't know how you would from that pick one over the other, and without having some personal knowledge or. Um, experience with individuals I would not feel good about recommending one over the other so all right uh, do we need to do anything with that no, sir. no. okay um, <coughs> we are reviewing a request from Jeff Shepard CPA PLC for name change There, they it appears they've submitted. Where the name of the firm is uh, is not an individual, but it's uh, like he's asking to be called Church CPAs or whatever it is. Um, I just didn't realize there were as many uh, firms out there that didn't carry individual names. There are quite a few out there that don't carry individual names. But in this particular case, since he was referring to it as Church Audit and Financial Solutions, <clears throat> to me, Bill, that just came, seemed kind of adverse and misleading. So management's recommendation is not to approve this. That would be my recommendation, yes. Why do you think that's misleading? Because we're, we're getting into an area where he's saying he's going to specialize in, in churches. Uh, I just have a problem with that, Casey. I, I, but you go through the other examples that they've submitted, and they were approved, of course, by previous boards that were probably not as wise as this one. Uh, but it would have the same uh, appearance that, that the name was uh, there in order to promote the practice, which is, I understand why you would try to do that. You got one here, accountants and business advisors for physicians. Right. right. I mean, CFO business strategies. Mark, I, I guess I, 
I don't like it either, but looking at the letter that's been written and looking at the other firms that have been approved and looking at the rules and what they say, I'm not sure we can do anything other than approve this. Um, I mean, I, I just, we've, we've got a precedent here. Uh, um, we've got a law firm that, um, I mean, they're from Chattanooga, and I tell you, it's a pretty good group of lawyers up there, and they do their homework, and, um, you know, this this won't be the end of it if we don't approve it here. And I'm so sure. we need to have a very good reason, I think, if we don't do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm open to listen to what anybody's got to say, but having reviewed the the attachments they sent with this letter and and looking at the rule here i i don't see how we can refuse this one based on what's been done in the past Stuart, if i may just you know and i'm not even sure this is rule based or anything like that but um if if an approval is granted it may be warranted to include in the letter that goes with the approval to say you know this doesn't mean necessarily that the board is um agreeing with you that you're church experts it just means that we're allowing you to use the name because we think the law and rules say so but you know kind of like in the legal profession you know a lawyer can't say that he is a certified civil trial specialist if he is not and that's a specific thing that has a specific meaning so since since the accountancy board is not in the business of having these sort of specialization um <clears throat> categories that they say okay if you complete x y and z then you're experts in this and we say so you know could stand to be made clear something along those lines that hey you know board's going to let you use the name but we're not but just letting you use the name doesn't mean we think you're church experts and you know you're going to be subject to the same rules and regs as anyone else i'm okay with that i think that makes sense mm -hmm. Yes, Henry. I make a comment. Absolutely. Uh, I think there's more here than what you're looking at in this letter. I think there's some other issues that perhaps uh, with this particular CPA and and uh, his firm that you perhaps ought the board ought to take a look at uh, in this matter before they grant approval of his request. Uh, I, I think I'd start out with just wanting to know where the address of his firm is. Uh, and secondly, who he's affiliated with. Uh, we have a, a non-CPA in town that uh, does a lot of church consulting and does a lot of financial services for churches that uh, apparently is uh, the, the if I remember right, the the article that was in the paper about this non-CPA was that he had about 3,000 churches on his client list. If, if I, I think that's the number I saw. And uh, I believe this this individual here, this CPA, is is somehow affiliated with, uh, with this non-CPA. And before uh, the board goes to make the approval of this, I would suggest that we look into that matter and see what uh, what the real affiliation would be. I'm afraid there could be some violations of our of our rules uh, in this relationship. That's helpful information. Right, so what is the recommendation here? Do we want to investigate further? Or does that have any issue or bearing on just a name change? That's a whole, or is that just an investigatory issue? I think that the name change is going to perpetuate the non-CPAs and services that he provides to all of the churches and organizations that he uh, is affiliated with. Okay. I hear what Mr. Hoss had to say, and I I, I think that, for one, I'd, I'd be, I guess, glad to know more about the individual and the firm if we have the right to ask for more information. But I'm I'm assuming this firm is in good registered firm in good standing as 
uh, in the current current name. Yes, uh, he is. Is there any reason we couldn't go back and ask for more information about the Since it is an expertise, is it just one individual or is it 20 individuals? Do, how many individuals have experience in churches? Uh, I think I know the individual Mr. Haas is referring to. I, I, if there's if he's an owner of this firm, I mean, that, you know, can he be an owner being a non-CPA? Okay, now, he, there is no other owner. Uh, Mr. Shepard is the sole owner. How long has Mr. Shepard been uh, registered as the owner of the firm? Um, they sent in the application in October, I believe, Henry. 2013? Of 2013. I think we ought to just not make a recommendation here, but maybe have a discussion of this at the full board tomorrow and um, try to make a, a good decision about how we proceed, yep. you know, whether it's to get more information or what. If the board's election is to get more information, I don't know that there's any prohibition against the board asking them to come down here in person in May because, you know, for folks who are coming before the board for other reasons to ask for things more like hey you know we want to have this person here so we can ask them questions and see you know what we think about them real life because you know it's one thing to see um, a letter from a law firm who is you know however talented the law firm may be they are a paid advocate for this person right and their business so um, that, just another something to discuss with the board tomorrow I don't have a problem with that. Um, I do wonder, though, and I think it would be good to have a full board discussion because you do have a in good standing firm. They're requesting a name change, which, and so it's kind of, uh, you know, we'll just have to discuss it further. Y'all obviously know more about it than we do, so. Okay, I have no problems recommending this to the full board. And then consideration of firm structure and ownership. Mark, you want to? Trying to find something in my iPad. I don't see it. Well, I apologize. It doesn't look like it's on there. Um, have been sent to you with the board packet. What you have is um, an application from a firm, DeCosmo Hyatt LLC. And the reason it's coming to you is because one of the owners is uh, going to be Joseph DeCosmo and Company PLLC as opposed to an individual. It's going to be a, a company owned by another company. Um, it says the PLLC is 100% owner and has 100% voting rights. Uh, that's why I'm bringing it to you because we've got to consider the firm structure. You've got a PLLC owning an LLC. Do you want to get into that type of convoluted ownership structure or do we want to stick with what the on license, the owner must be an individual. What is the business that they're going to perform? What page are you on, Mark? As any CPA firm may include non-licensee owners, provided that all non-licensee owners are active individual participants in the CPA firm or affiliated entities.
anybody recall the the Cosmo Hyatt? Isn't Hyatt a, a organization of lawyers? Hmm? This isn't. This isn't a national organization. This is okay. Larry, as far as I know, Larry's got an office in Franklin. Okay. Or Brentwood, or okay. somewhere. I'm, I'm thinking of something different than that. The Cosimo is a licensed CPA firm, right? Right. right. I mean, they're not a non-licensed owner, then, are they? Not into not individual, but they're they're a licensed CPA firm. Mark, what is management's recommendation? My initial recommendation, Bill, is to deny it because I don't think you want to get into convoluted structures where you have companies owning companies owning companies. But Mr. Stewart makes a valid point. Uh, the Cosmo PLLC is a licensee, technically. They're doing this, I would assume, just for liability reasons or, you know, they, I know they just acquired this practice or merged this practice recently because it was in the news, but I would assume they're, they're doing this fashion just to keep that LLC veil in place for a period of time or something. There could be some market, marketing related reason too, but, but I, mean, I don't think there's any convoluted reason for doing it there it's a, probably got sound business reason Osimo firm has acquired the Hyatt firm yeah, yeah. and they're basically trying to capitalize on both names yeah. along with a you know, legal structure mm -hmm. First time we've had an application where we had a firm owning a firm. National basis, many of the national firms have subsidiaries that are in related businesses. Publicly traded firm in Memphis. I want to make a recommendation. Yes, I'd, I would make a recommendation we approve it unless we can find a good reason the rules not to. I mean, I, um, Does Mr. Whitaker, have any, do you have any opinion on this? You know, Mark asked me the question and I kind of looked at it from his perspective first until I figured out kind of as you did that the PLLC is a licensed firm and it's, you know, the, the Cosmo person behind the firm is a licensee as well. So, I mean, it may not always be so easy to trace the ownership structure and the voting rights and making sure that, you know, the majority voting rights and whatnot that are required to have a firm permit in Tennessee are met. Uh, the more complex the company owning company structures get, but with this one, it, I mean, doesn't seem that difficult to look you know, look beyond the, the PLLC to see who owns what and who's a licensee and do they have enough um, majority or more ownership interest. And in this case, it kind of looks like they do. So, um, but but it was it was my kind of idea to bring it before the board because 
it is sort of an issue of first impression, even if, you know, mine and Mark's opinions notwithstanding, it's since my time with the board, I haven't seen you guys consider it. So I thought it'd be at least a good thing to, to talk over and think through um, no matter what decision is ultimately made. I have a motion, motion that we recommend approval to the board. Yes. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes. So with that, uh, I believe that concludes. Uh, Mark, I had one question. I had, yes, I've heard of some grumblings on issuance of permits. Are we uh, up to speed on issuing all permits and things of that nature? Do we have a backlog or are we timely? We don't have much of a backlog, uh, Trey. We, uh, we've probably got a few firm permits that we're behind on, but other than that, we're good. Okay. Just need to make an effort to get those approved, please. Yes, sir. Any other business? Oh, um, Wendy. I would assume it would have to be um, handled at the top level. I mean, but you probably know more about the peer review detail rules than I do. I mean, it's a. Uh, just a shell at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I w you would have to do it at the actual operating firm. I mean, I would think you would do it at the firm level, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Like he said, you probably know more than we do about it. Would that rule apply to DeCosimo and therefore this firm? I would think, I I would think the Cosimo would want them to follow, expect them to follow the mothership's <laughs> rules. <laughs> or. I mean, Mark, you've had this issue before. Not sure we have an answer to those yeah I, don't, I think it's something we're going to have to think through and mark you and your staff may need to along with legal figure out what our rules state and then if we have this system i mean there may be a need a rule change or something to specifically address i can only imagine in this coming age of firm acquisitions which there's going to be many that we're going to see this issue in the future.
Any other issues or questions that we need to cover in executive committee? None here. No. All right. Uh, I think we're adjourned. Okay. Thank you. It's cold up here. Dry it? tonight. Are y'all cold? <laughs> yes. I'm My cool. Theater. And I'm typically. I, I, I prefer to be. It is. It's. <laughs> this is. Yes. Beyond what I'm looking it's for. getting very cold here. He must have been feeding too. Oh. Ground up. In the absence of the chair, uh, Marcus asked that I. Most of the items are um, Mr. Substitute Chairman, yes. Uh, <laughs> that, that, it's the uh, director's words, not mine. Um, the on the report, I believe it's items number one through, wait a minute. Oh, um, okay. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Lovis, there are. Privilege tax, aren't they? One through seven are privilege tax. It just, <coughs> um, it just dawned on me that, um, there are 12 items on on the report that's on the iPads, but with the updated cases that have come in with reports since then, there are actually 24 on my paper report. So uh, we will need to get those additional items uploaded before tomorrow's meeting. Um, Mr. Crocker said that he would, he will be glad to go make copies for you. And while we're doing that, um, maybe Mr. Mills could go ahead and tell the committee about the statistics and then go from there. Mr. Chairman, for today, I have you have on your iPad uh, my original report. However, I would like for you to look at the handout I just passed out uh, with regard to what I'm going to try to make a regular addition to these statistics. Uh, Mr. Royson had requested some information last meeting uh, regarding the status of opening, closing complaints, that sort of thing. So if you look at that last page, I basically have uh, two sections there. For this year, I have a complaint status, which, which shows us that there were 94 complaints opened in 2013. Uh, the board took action on 56 of those. Uh, we're about to take action uh, as of today and tomorrow on 24 more. Uh, there were seven complaints closed without board action. Those are your cease and desist orders and that sort of thing. And that leaves us a balance of 2013 complaints uh, outstanding at seven. Uh, I was just kind of wanting y'all to look at that. I mean, it, it seems kind of okay to me, but I was, you know, any other input you have or requests, I'll be glad to try and work on that. Uh, the second part shows basically what y'all have done. Uh, you heard 45 cases uh, that were open prior to this year. Uh, you saw 56 cases heard 56 cases of the 2013 complaints. That's redundant. And then in January, again, you're going to see 24, uh, giving you a total cases heard of 125 for the year. And this is a calendar year. Now, I got my little spreadsheet to work in, and I came up with the average days from the opening of the complaint to the board's hearing is now 113. 
which is substantially lower than what it used to be. Uh, and if you look at our range between 46 days and 196 days, it, it, it's, it's spread out, but we're doing a lot better on our average. Uh, in fact, the average and the median are the same. Uh, is there anything else that you can think of? Uh, if you find this useful, great. Uh, if you have any additions or deletions, I'd be glad to work on it. Questions so Don? Not, thank you for putting it together. Quite welcome. Um, And the first seven are uh, letters of warning, and then uh, eight, nine. Eleven, pardon me, eleven through ten is dismiss the complaint. Um, Anyone have a question regarding these recommendations? Uh, just a question on 10. Chris, could okay. you just kind of walk me through that one just a little bit more? Sure. Uh, this is the um, complaint that was on the October 2013 report that uh, the board uh, requested be deferred to this meeting uh, in order to allow Mr. Butler to do some additional investigation. It's kind of a a two-track um, investigation part of it into uh, whether the alleged dishonesty and and those kind of allegations of the respondent were more in the nature of an employment dispute versus actual dishonesty or something like that in the performance of services and then uh, what the board specifically asked for more information on is the complainants allegation that there were multiple uh, clients of the firm that the respondent now no longer works for um, that were unhappy with the respondent's work uh, because it was allegedly substandard and caused them problems and, and things of that nature. Um, according to Mr. Butler's report, as I have read through it, it, looks like his conclusion was that there was insufficient evidence to substantiate um, the allegations about unhappy clients and, in fact, uh, at least one of the clients that the complainant referenced that supposedly wasn't happy is still a client of the respondent at the new place he works now. So that doesn't really seem like that would be somebody who is unhappy, or at least if they were, they've long since been made happy. Um, the, the, other, the other piece of it about um, internal controls, review by partner, uh, you know, whether you had to sign or initial something, um, not sure that it's the exact same analysis of insufficient evidence to substantiate, but um, you know, <coughs> it just it seems like, based on everything I've seen, and Ray, feel, please feel free to chime in if if I'm leaving something out. But um, looks like if this was more of an employment matter, like the the firm that the respondent used to work for, who's the complainant in this matter, was not happy that not only is he continuing to practice but that he took some clients with him when he left and you know any any stuff like that the board doesn't typically get involved in client disputes or who gets clients or whatnot and if there are severe enough violations in that regard there are uh, civil court remedies for those things that are frankly outside the board's ability and jurisdiction to provide so um, <clears throat> Again, at the, at the end of the day, it just doesn't seem like there would be enough hard and fast evidence there to prove one or more violations of the laws or rules at a formal hearing, and, and that's why the uh, recommendation, whereas before was tentatively for a consent order, after further investigation, it's now for dismissal. And um, with that, I'll ask Ray if he has anything to add. Well, the only thing that I would add to it is that uh, at the last board meeting when you considered this case before the comments were made that that you felt like uh, that what I initially investigated seemed like an internal firm matter rather than something that the board should be taking up and um, 
second piece of it that had the problems with the clients or the appearance of problems between clients, you wanted more information on it. So I took that. My charge was to go back and investigate the uh, possible uh, client problem there where the, where the clients weren't made happy, weren't served out uh, in, in a, uh, I can't remember the, the term that we proper procedures in handling the uh, handling the clients. So I did that and in investigating that, um, as Chris said, uh, every charge of every client that was there was answered. And if, if not answered, there was an affidavit from the person that was involved that said, I don't have any problems with this anymore. So I recommended dismissal based on the primarily based on the second charge because it seemed that the board was heading toward dismissal on the first charge anyway. Well, on the first charge, what I think is significant is that he offered to resign and they didn't accept his resignation and continued to work. For, for nearly a year before he left and went somewhere else. Okay, uh, items one through 10, are there any other questions? Not to uh, entertain a move, uh, motion for approval. Move. Second. Okay. Carries. Number 11. Mr. Uh, Bloffus, on that one, the, uh, the board also considered this matter at the uh, October 13 meeting. And while as a matter of course, you typically don't bring um, complaints back where the board has already authorized a settlement, um, this every once in a while there there's a case where you look at it and say hey you know maybe a second look is warranted um, and a number of factors played into that and, and both myself and and mr. Crocker agreed that we would not have any problem if if the board were inclined to grant the respondents request to um, have a reduction from a thousand to five hundred dollar civil penalty uh, the respondent hasn't had any prior complaints uh, before this late peer review. He had multiple peer reviews on time with no substantive work issues in any of them. The peer review that he was late on has now been submitted also with no problems. And um, it really just really just looks like a, a bad year and life happened to him. And, um, you know, just kind of on a personal connection level, having talked to the owner of this firm, he really went out on a limb and, and stood by his employee in a way that he didn't have to. I mean, he paid out of pocket for better than $20,000 worth of medical bills and, and also paid this office manager who usually handled the peer review stuff, also paid his salary while he was recovering. So um, that's, that's, that's tough for any firm, but especially for a one-man show. So based on the, the financial hardship from the prior year and the other factors I mentioned, that's where um, the reduction from a thousand to five hundred came in. Okay. Um, other questions? Is there a motion to accept the recommendation? So moved. Second. Number eleven is approved. Number twelve. Uh, number 12 is pretty pretty straightforward. The, the uh, respondent CPA in question had um, had his Kentucky CPA license suspended for one year, effective September 20 of, of last year, running through September 20 of this year, and uh, it appears that he was permanently enjoined from doing a lot of the kind of professional work that CPAs do permanently. And so... Um, the respondent did self-report the, the disciplinary action and, and through his attorney indicated a willingness to, to sign a consent order that imposes the same kind of restrictions on his Tennessee license to run concurrent with his Kentucky discipline. Um, and if the board were agreeable to that, then a formal hearing wouldn't be necessary uh, to get this person off the street. So based on, based on that expressed willingness, to take the matching discipline here in Tennessee, um, re that's the recommendation. To dismiss the complaint. Oh no, to to have the same one-year suspension um, that this person is under in Kentucky, 
and also the permanent injunction against the kind of work product that Kentucky says he can't do. So, let me with this because number 12 in the written copy doesn't jibe with 12 on the iPad. Okay, I'll do my best. So, oh. all right, on Let, the let's go on ahead the, and if, if if this is uh, we'll reconcile the numbers after you look at it, but. Is there any questions regarding the recommendation on number 12? I just have one question. I'm, I'm, it's unclear to me. So it's a one-year suspension of license, but a permanent injunction from ever issuing, doing, being a CPA? Um, the, the list of things that, that is in the summary there is a verbatim recitation of, from the Kentucky order. And I, I'm not a CPA, and I don't play one on television, but that – like I said, looks like most of the work that a CPA does. I mean, other than, you know, maybe doing tax work or back of the house stuff that has to be signed off on by somebody else, uh, I, you know, seems like a very narrow range of work product that this person could do after such a suspension ran out. But, you know, th if that's what his attorney negotiated with the Kentucky board and he's willing to live with it here too, then, you know, then. <coughs> I don't know how this process on the investigation piece of it works, but did you have a conversation with the Kentucky Board about this individual or get any type of clarity to make sure that's what, in fact, it meant? Or did you just rely on the documents that their attorney gave you? I um, talked to the attorney and relied on the agreed order from Kentucky and their disciplinary <laughs> reports that, that they issued. Gotcha. And so um, okay. that's that was the basis of um, my conversation. If Mark talk to somebody or somebody else did then um, on the uh, on the written or the hard copy paper you just got 12 on the iPad is number 22 on uh, hard copy you just got And the one we just reviewed, um, any further questions? Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, so what we've just been handed, I, all the numbers seem to sync through seven. That's correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. The one, numbers one through seven on the iPad are identical to one through seven on the hard copy. Uh, the other complaints were added in at varying, varying places. Number eight on the iPad is number 12. And the hard copy number nine is number 13. Number 10 is number 14. And number 11 on the iPad is number 20 on the hard copy. I've already addressed number 12, so. Um, Looks like the items still to be considered are items number 8, 9, 10, and 11. Um, you have three letters of warning and a, and a letter of instruction for those items. And um, the committee would like to take a moment to read those before voting, then that'd be fine. Eight, nine, and ten are privilege tax matters. Number eleven is use of the word accounting, and um, number eleven we have an affidavit, and some of the changes that need to be made have already been made, and the rest of them are in process. So, me again item number 12 on the iPad is what number 
Uh, number 12 on the iPad is number 22 on the hard copy. Are there any questions regarding 8, 9, 10, 11? Seventeen, eighteen. All of these are after number eleven. You've already covered numbers twelve, thirteen, and fourteen on the hard copies. Right. The next set of items after eight through eleven. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 you've covered, 21 is new, 22 you've covered, 23 and 24 are new. Got a question on number 11. How are we going to monitor this? It's a non licensee. We're just going to go back out to their place of business in three months to see if the sign has changed? Or I have the investigator that um, got the affidavit and, and took note of the changes that have already been made. They'll just go back out there. Oh, this is the rule, but accounting is not permitted unless you're a CPA. I have a motion to approve 8 through 11 unless there are further questions on those. Second. And those are approved 8 through 11. So All right. The next one is 15. Numbers 15 through 19 are all uh, varying kinds of dismissals. Um, committee members can, can read through <laughs> those summaries. The, the only one that has a little bit of a different twist on it is, is new number 18. Because the um, investigators were unable to locate this respondent in any way, um, the it, the complaint itself will be dismissed without prejudice, meaning that if this person turns back up in the future, then the subject matter of the complaint can still be pursued, and there will be a notation in the, the license file that they have to have specific board approval in order to um, get their license reactivated, which would entail payment of the privilege tax or um, showing proof of a payment plan just like the other privilege tax folks. Number 21, um, although this is a privilege tax matter, um, there is a disciplinary recommendation here because this individual has been before the board before on privilege tax. And uh, it also appears that um, was a lack of change of address notice as required by rule when uh, this individual moved out of state. And so that's um, kind of the, the rationale for the civil penalty here. Normally, pr first go around privilege tax, we give them a letter of warning if they get back into compliance, but this person having already had the benefit of that and then now being delinquent again and moving out of state and not telling the board and not paying all their stuff until the investigator hounded them. I um, think uh, civil penalties in order for that. How do we come up with the amount? Um, the the original recommendation from the investigator was um, two thousand five hundred dollars. That was based on five hundred dollars per year because there were originally three years of privilege tax delinquency, and then five hundred for failure to notify change of address, and five hundred for failure to respond to the board complaint in a timely manner. Um, at my suggestion, it was reduced to 2000 only because by statute, the first year of delinquency and privilege tax may by law only be addressed by a letter of warning. So there's no, 
civil penalty possible to be attached to that. So staying consistent with 500 for the other uh, four remaining violations, that's how we got to the $2,000 civil penalty. Number 23, um, this respondent is a, an Alabama licensee who um, did not timely notify the Tennessee Board of the revocation of his Alabama license for, it was based on non-renewal. Um, however, during the time frame that the investigation was ongoing, this individual did have his Alabama license reinstated, but as of today has not contacted our board or the investigator in any way about his Tennessee complaint and so uh, at this time the the recommendation would be for a voluntary revocation consent order but if this person shows back up and you know the board is inclined to a lesser settlement and revocation possibly a civil penalty then uh, that'd be something that could be addressed later but you know, if you're going to be revoked in another state and not tell the Tennessee board about it and not respond to the complaint or the investigator about it, I think you start with revocation and work back from there. Because, um, you know, have, you have this professional license, you've agreed to subject yourself to, to the rules and regulations and just hadn't done his part there. So that's 23. And um, the last one is 24. Um, <clears throat> the respondent um, did not respond to a CPE audit and according to her she was working for a defense contractor of some kind and all of her paperwork was there and then she left after her contract ran out remember that her paperwork was there and but it had already been destroyed so she can't prove up her 80 hours so she's like look I you know I understand that this is on me I, I should have kept up my paperwork better but I didn't I'm, I'm happy to to get the CPE in compliance and uh, so again with a first offense recommend a $500 civil penalty completing the 80 hours for the reporting period that she missed and 24 penalty hours as set forth by rule and she's got to complete all this 180 days from the day the consent order is signed or it's an automatic revocation questions regarding that one yeah, one, just one question on that one, Chris. So did the individual just get the audit request and just not respond, or did she send stuff or call and say, hey, I've realized I don't have it. My bad. What do we do? I think the initial <clears> – <throat> I think there was a lag time in the initial response, but um, part of that could have been her figuring out that she doesn't have it and can't get it. But it, it, at least by my reading of the file, it's not like she just kind of – ducked and hid and ran until the investigator caught up with her it just you know but there was a delay uh, but i can't say for sure the genesis of it or the division of responsibility for that delay um we can separately approve this but i guess what i would entertain is a motion that uh approves Recommendations of so moved. We have very good. So we'll the uh, end of my legal report, Mr. Chairman. Unless Mark has something else, the committee can adjourn. Just um, tomorrow, you'll get a hard copy to the other board members. Okay. If there's no other business. Uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.